Okay. So this is a little bit off the beaten path. But what I have here is a 1959 Gibson Melody Maker. And the reason it's a great guitar, I'm going to tell you, the reason it's affordable, I'll start with this time. It's it was affordable to me because I was in a music store that's no longer uh, down on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Yeah, it could have been 20 years ago. And I had a, I had a tone bender distortion pedal that was kind of rare from the early 70s. And um, this was in the store without the, this contraption on here, which I'll talk about in a minute also. But it was just a melody maker with a humbucker pickup in it. And um, so I traded straight across for it. And I had about, I think I paid 500 bucks for that distortion pedal at the time. A friend of mine, my friend Ken, Kenny Etchison, used to call it my secret weapon because it was so musical and it was such a great overdrive fuzz. But that's what we do, you know, we trade stuff away. It has the sunburst that we all kind of recognize from the 50s, right? From the Les Paul Juniors. Um, it's all mahogany. I got this one refretted, which helps the playability, of course. Um, I have the action pretty low where I can still play kind of single lines or blues stuff, stuff. but mainly I have it set up for a uh, slide guitar. And I also use like really heavy strings on this, of course, because the pedal steel, I'm not really bending it in this, uh, with this setup. So I started with like 14, maybe 17, 20, uh, 30, I go all the way to like the high 50s, probably on the low string here. But um, yeah, you want them to ring true and ring really thick, um, like a pedal steel would be, right? So even if you don't go the pedal steel route that I went, or the palm pedal route, it's still a great guitar just to have him play, and it's, it'll get you into that old rosewood, nice Gibson neck for a fraction of the cost that the other guitars would. And actually, you know, come to think of it, um, I just realized that the intro song that I used to, for these uh, series on my YouTube channel, What Makes This Guitar Great, the track that's playing in the back is from uh, a CD of mine called Monkeys and Slides. The song, title song, Monkeys and Slides, you can hear a lot of this palm pedal in action on that track. Uh, you'll hear a lot of my soundscaping done with the uh, palm pedal for sure. But to the guitar, the Melody Makers, which I think they started making in 1959, um, were uh, even a more introductory guitar to the market than the Les Paul Juniors were. And this one, you know, the obvious physical differences is that it doesn't have the wider headstock, which on Les Pauls and Gibsons, they had an extra wings on here, which are two other pieces of wood, usually glued on. So this is just, the whole neck was like one piece of wood on this guitar. Um, the body is super thin. The input jack and all the control knobs and everything are, are, are like, or uh, tightened, fastened to the front plastic plate. So you take it off, everything comes off with it. So these are kind of physical things that takes a minute to get used to. I mean, the guitar is so lightweight um, and the knobs are in a weird place and the jack's in a weird place, but you get used to that stuff. Um, now, this one, the reason, one, another reason this was even affordable or able for me to trade for the pedal was because somebody had routed out the Melody Maker uh, ceramic pickup and put in this humbucker, which happens to be like an old Tom Holmes pickup from back way back when. I guess those early ceramic pickups in um, Melody Makers never quite caught on uh, as much as the P90s or the humbuckers for some odd reason. Um, I changed the tuning because I figured once it was modded I might as well go all the way and make it a playable guitar. It's kind of cool because you're getting into the same shaped neck as a Les Paul Jr. or maybe as a Les Paul itself, right? The nice thick Gibson neck from 59. It's a great, very sturdy, thick, wonderful neck. With this deep, must be Brazilian rosewood. If some of you guys know, I've always been uh, an advocate that the neck is a is a major producer of tone in a guitar. I still believe in that, and uh, this is probably a good example because this neck is really substantial on this tiny little thin body. I don't think it has a deep neck tenon. I probably not. I don't think there's enough room in here for a deep neck tenon. But one thing I've learned with deep neck tenons, they do make a difference in the sound of the guitar. But sometimes I think it's possible to add that bottom end. You lose the neck tenon in with an amplifier. Um, but the overall tone of this guitar is just wonderful and pure. Now, um, the humbucker helps, having a nice thick humbucker. And also, 
I've always been an advocate of one pickup guitars. I have my Esquire, my Les Paul Jr. My favorite ones are the ones with one pickup that just seem to sustain forever. I did a video recently on the Alan Holdsworth guitar. And I think these things, having one pickup and uh, not having the ABR bridge contribute to the sustain of a guitar. It didn't cost me very much money. Uh, that's probably one reason I've kept it around very much because I knew I could never sell it for that much. And it's just a great sounding instrument. Now for a while, I had just a wraparound tailpiece on it. Once again, contributing to my theory that just uh, a wraparound bridge and a one pickup makes for the best sustaining guitar. But I've always loved country music, um, or uh, at least Americana music. Um, I love the sound of pedal steels. And the pedal steel, if you guys know anything about a pedal steel, it's like flying a helicopter. It's like really hard. I assume flying a helicopter is hard. But there's levers, and there's pedals to push, and then there's all the strings and the weird tunings. So, short of that, I kind of went the Homer Simpson route. But um, I went looking and found this on an old, um, kind of a cheap Telecaster from the 70s. And um, it was made by Bigsby, and it was called a palm pedal. This is like a simplified pedal steel concept where you have like one lever per string. So, you know, now that I think back on it, I think the first time I ever heard something like this was um, Led Zeppelin when uh, Jimmy Page used the uh, B-Bender. I think it was the same kind of concept. The B-Bender, you had to cut into the guitar and you could pull it up, These you could pull these strings um, higher with by pulling down the strap, which is always been kind of a strange concept, concept to me. And I actually heard Clarence White with the birds like back, whoa, way back in the 70s, um, playing one. But I think the really, I think the th thing that really hooked me was just the love of pedal steel and of sound. I probably didn't realize that I was digging that sound so much because I'd heard so much of it on Led Zeppelin stuff too. I've actually seen people with like six levers on the guitar and all these wacky tunings, which is, that gets in pretty deep. But I think standard, they had one lever for the B string, one uh, lever for the G string, uh, and they pull up. Uh, unlike a tremolo arm, it doesn't de depress the note, it goes up to a fixed note. And you can set that whatever interval you want, well, at least within the um, parameters that the screw will allow. It's a pretty primitive idea. It just kind of rocks down and it's stopped by the length of the screw screwed through the screw hole here. Um, there's a little bolt. So depending on how you, that's how you tune it up. If that's sharp, you just lengthen a little bit. And if you, uh, if it's flat, you shorten the screw a little bit to give you a little more play. Anyway, that's, I think traditionally that's how these things were set up where the uh, the high B string goes up a whole step. And the G string uh, goes up a whole step as well. So you can get. combine this together you can get some really great combinations and if you know you know theory you know your way around a fretboard you can you can fool some people with a volume pedal which I was used to because I grew up listening to Larry Carlton and Robin Ford of course I could kind of simulate and with a little delay and reverb action going on there I can simulate a pedal steel and I've used it on all of my records I think I have like some you know in lieu of being able to play keyboards um, I just layer guitars and it's also my you know, years of being such a Led Zeppelin fan that I love all the layers of guitars in the back. Um, so if you listen to any of my stuff, you're going to hear this going on somewhere in the back. Let's hear it with a little bit of distortion on here. <laughs> Awesome guitar. I used to go to the NAMM show and I used to always bug the guys at the Bigsby um, booth and say, why don't you make this device anymore? Because there are some other brands out there that kind of do the same thing, but none of them quite feel like this. This one has, I mean, I kind of liken it to like a Harley Davidson. It was just like really sturdy and nothing wiggly and it's just really a nice uh, feel. Um, and I always bug them about making another one, but they haven't yet. But you can still find them. If you look around on eBay, uh, they pop up every now and then, sometimes on old Telecasters. They have to be mounted on a flat um, 
top body. They can't be on an arch top. Like a, you couldn't put it on a Les Paul or a, or a Strat or anything. It's a great instrument. Uh, this one became my go-to kind of specialized guitar for doing the pedal steel slidey type effects, um, which has served me well over the years. And it's pretty easy to use. I found that a lot of the um, a lot of my work, a lot of the trouble getting it adjusted to the right shape of your hand. I have so many holes here, and I didn't care because, like, once again, this guitar was kind of a misfit when I got it. So I moved the palm pedal a couple times on it, so I have too many holes in here. But I had to get to the right um, place in my palm where I could pick with my fingers and still use the palm pedal. Also, I had to replace the wraparound bridge with this roll, um, roller bridge. It has little rollers on it. And it was a different spacing. I got so, out and I dialed up the holes and I drilled some new holes for this roller bridge. It's not the most pretty thing in the world, but it works. Um, so look, if you want to get into the feel of an old uh, 50s Les Paul that can't afford it like most people can't, um, even Les Paul Juniors are around 10 grand these days, um, check into the Melody Makers. There's a lot of these on the market. Um, even with the ceramic pickup and the original, even all original, it might be a few thousand dollars, but that's far less than a Les Paul Jr. or a Les Paul, of course. Or if you find one with a cracked headstock, or changed tuning keys, or changed bridge, or or changed pickup, you can get them for a song. Um, yeah, so this is a 1959 Gibson Melody Maker. Like I say, it's got a thin body, it's got a weird looking headstock, but it sounds great. Also, I wanted to mention that this is actually a full-size Melody Maker. They made a three-quarter size uh, model with a shorter scale length as they did the uh, Les Paul Jr. But this is a full-scale one. You want the manly size. Okay, I'm going back to bed.